Welcome to the next Track Zone Conversation. It's Tuesday in the 23rd week of 2019. That's a lot of 20s, which means it's time for Talk and Science. Dr. Brad Tucker's here. Brad, happy Tuesday. Yeah, how's it going? Fantastic, buddy. Uh, we were just saying that, uh, you know, the earth keeps on spinning. That's right. It's, you know, it's uh, 15 degrees per hour. It's uh, what, <laughs> moving about 130 kilometers per second around the Milky Way. Um, it takes about 200 million years for the Earth and the Sun to do a lap around the Milky Way. Wow. Well, back so, to you. So, you know, that's a really long time. <laughs> I was just going to say, back to your uh, 15 degrees of movement. It's about 15 degrees here at Trexone HQ. Uh, freezing. 15 degrees. <laughs> it was minus. We had snow around uh, <laughs> last night. So, I, I, though I did hear there was snow that just crossed the Queensland border. Yes, I, I woke up to reports uh, from uh, some storm chasers that I follow. They're, uh, they're out in the granite belt. And, uh, yeah, they had to get up at 4 a.m. And, and put a, a super high watt uh, light bar out into the desert. But but they saw snow, apparently. Yeah, I'm not, yeah it's, um, it was brisk, let's say that. I think there, on the top of the mountain, we were getting gusts of about 100 k's an hour. Oh, wow. How does that go when, you, when you're trying to observe uh, the sky? Well, so that's actually, so one of the things, you know, always people think about clouds, but telescopes have wind limits, like of how much, because essentially, obviously, the, the support systems can't hold a telescope that stable. So you actually have monitoring systems, not just for clouds, but also humidity, because if the dew point drops, you can get condensation on the mirror. And obviously, if you get both wind and gusts, that can do with stability. So telescopes often close, not just because it's cloudy or rainy, but because of these other weather factors where you can't be stable enough or or safe enough is it really the telescopes though or is it just the astronomers that don't want to be out in those conditions well no <laughs> i mean usually we're in a closed building <laughs> pressing buttons on the computer so you know it, it's fine but when you do start to see this whole you know it's a 10-story building and you feel the building start to wobble you're like all right we're gonna close yeah, we're gonna wrap this up yeah well something else that has uh, wind limits and cloud lim well not so much cloud limits but definitely wind limits are rocket launches and uh they're coming to australia brad they are you know and we were kind of chatting about what is the you know future uh of things happening in australia and, and i said one of the things that can happen uh, that is great is that the possibility of rocket launches from Australia and sure enough um, one of the groups in the Northern Territory called Equatorial Launch Australia has announced that they have an agreement uh, with NASA to launch four sounding rockets from um, sometime next year, sometime in 2020. They're not crude launches, but they are pretty significant for NASA, aren't they? They are. So sounding rockets are a lot smaller. So essentially, if you imagine where space is, like there's different heights and there's different tools you get there. I use high altitude balloons. We get there to about 40 Ks up in the atmosphere. That's about the height. Satellites have to go from about 150 to 200 kilometers and above. That's where you can actually get an orbit. So there's this kind of, you know, no person zone land air, not air between 50 and 150 kilometers where we still need to do measurements. We still need to do experiments, but how do you get there? And that's the sounding rocket. These are essentially these are essentially the jets that were the very first versions of like the the scramjets and planes that NASA were flying before they did the moon missions. Essentially, you kind of do a, a suborbital loop. So it's still a big deal. And a lot of this is kind of this vote of confidence. You know, NASA likes to run and tightly control things, and it takes a lot of goodwill and work. Um, to say, hey, you know, we're going to do it for you or, or, on, or on land. So it's kind of, you know, you have to, what, crawl before you can walk? So you have to fly sounding rockets before you fly the big rockets. Right. Well, and it is a pretty big coup for Australia and Equatorial Launch Australia because uh, it's the first time that NASA's agreed to launch their rockets, not only uh, from a non-government-owned site, but uh, also a foreign site as, as well, I believe. Yeah, that's right. It's essentially they're, they're leasing out the work essentially to be done here from Australia. And that was always one of the goals and visions that was identified is not that Australia should build rockets or launch their own. You know, there's lots of groups doing better work on this, but we have the locations to actually launch it from. And if we set up the spaceports and 
thinking of it very kind of, this is kind of what um, Cape Canaveral in Florida has become, where it's not just a NASA site. It really is like an airport. It's a spaceport. SpaceX is there, Blue Origin. There's a few other groups that have set up in Cape Canaveral now that that's kind of where their rockets take from. This is definitely a model that is applicable to Australia and definitely what ELA has kind of identified that, hey, once we get this running, then potentially larger rockets and other groups can start coming in and launching from here as well. And the interest is there. You know, one of the reasons is that satellites and things like to go near the equator. And, you know, the equatorial part of their name gives away their location. They're very close to the equator. And for those not familiar with Arnhem Land, where, um, which is kind of between Darwin and halfway between Darwin and Cairns, it's pretty dry and desert like. <laughs> and um, rockets like that, you know, um, rockets don't like wind and weather, you know, they that's why Florida always has launch delays because it's Florida. And, I mean, <laughs> like it is Northern Territory isn't that. And it is 20 degrees closer to the equator than Cape Canaveral. Oh, wow. Like Florida isn't that far south. It's interesting too because I think Arnhem Land is a little bit more isolated from the severe weather. Obviously up north it's the tropics. We do get a lot of cyclones and, and stuff like that up there. But they're all off the coast. They don't generally form uh, in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Yep. Um you know, they still do, but not yeah. as often. And they sweep east rather than sort of south where Arnhem, Land's, where Arnhem Land is. So it truly is yeah. uh, probably the best place on earth to, to launch rockets from. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's it's like real estate. It's location, location, location. And, and they have all of that going for it. And they identified it early on. And, and I think the great thing here is the potential, right? You know, we're talking about from an Australian aspect that groups coming over here, it's investment in Australia, especially in air, regional areas and really rural areas that don't have a lot of industry that could use this boost. But then you can think further afield. Let's start imagine there are bigger rockets that are launched. You know, the tourism alone from coming to see these launches, it will be fantastic for the area and the communities. And in fact, it's it's interesting because so, you know, Arnhem Land and the the traditional owners of Arnhem Land have worked throughout the whole process with or Equatorial Launch Australia to make sure that everyone benefits from this. And I think that's the great part of this this story is that it's a it's a win literally all around. NASA gets a good southern southern launch site. And it's a great win for all aspects of Australia, and it really signals where Australia can go in this space. And of course, we do recognise the traditional owners of Arnhem Land, and, and I think it's absolutely fantastic that we can open it up um, to being the next great spaceport. Yeah, I, I, I really think it is, and I think there's so much potential there. And, and that's not the only place in Australia. You know, you go to other parts of Queensland um, where groups are looking at, or to the southern part of Australia, because you start getting near the Southern Pole. And that's where a lot of satellites go. You know, Australia you know everyone jokes that we're this giant island well we're finally starting to take advantage of our giant islandness <laughs> well something else that's a little bit uh, like a giant island is uh, jupiter's great red spot it's been around for a couple of centuries but it might not be around for another couple of centuries yeah so this is kind of cool so i mean everyone kind of knows the great red spot the beauty mark of, of jupiter and it the, you know it, it's believed to be about 400 years old there are some observations in the 1600s and what we definitely know is that it's been shrinking over time. The first estimates put it that it was about five times the width of the Earth. Um, now it's closer to about two and a half or three. It's definitely shrinking. Uh, and some an amateur astronomer in central Queensland was uh, looking at Jupiter. So Jupiter is always a great target to look at through any telescope. Um, and started to see that the great red spot, like there's like a blade, there's like a chunk that's jotted off the great red spot. And it appears to be that something is dramatically changing in the great red spot in this storm system. So Brad, it, it really is just a giant weather system that's gone on for hundreds of years, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's essentially like those cyclones we were talking about. That's that's literally what it is. We've seen it rotating. In fact, people who have imaged Jupiter over the course of weeks, you can actually see the storm system moving. It's just a storm system that happens to be three times the size of a planet. And so, like, yeah, I mean, it's pretty bad. But like all storm systems, it's always been believed that it should dissipate. Just as storm systems here go away, this should happen on, on Jupiter. And it appears that there's something happening dramatically right now with the Great Red Spot. It's we know that it has been shrinking, but something subtly has really changed on Jupiter. Going back, uh, Neptune had the great dark spot. 
and um, the Hubble Space Telescope imaged it and actually saw the great dark, dark spot disappear. So like we actually saw this storm system go away. And that really solidified that, yeah, the Jupiter's, Jupiter spot could go away at some point. So maybe there's some sort of dramatic change that's going to accelerate the process. You know, some people said it looks like it's kind of unraveling, which isn't quite right. But something funny is happening uh, in the Great Red Spot. Well, there is a mission on the way to Jupiter, or Juno, uh, and it's going to be there in about July. And I believe that they're going to focus all their efforts now on, on identifying you know what's going what's going on yeah so so juno does these like weird 60 day 60 day loops around jupiter because jupiter has lots of radiation that it has to get around and so they always kind of choose where their next point they're going to fly by jupiter and obviously the, the great red spot's always been of interest and now it's kind of like something's actually happening now because one of the first things they imaged was the great red spot because of course um, but then it's kind of like, well, something's changed. So now by flying really close, I mean, they s essentially skim the planet. Um, they fly at about the same height a lot of the satellites on Earth do. So, you know, it, it's really close. So they're going to focus on the Great Red Spot, not only through imaging, but things like measuring gravity and the wind speed, um, uh, measurements of like ma magnetism, essentially what energy is there, um, because they kind of do know that there's like these jet streams on Jupiter. So maybe a jet stream's changed, maybe the winds changed, maybe the levels dropped, you know, weather conditions change on Earth and that's what creates some storm systems or cyclones to become bigger or, or some to get weakened. And maybe it's a similar thing happening now, but you know, this is not over and it definitely will be a, a source of even more interest over the next coming months. And, um, you know, kudos to the, astro uh, the amateur community. Yeah. That's, that's how it was found. Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, of course, through it all, we have to thank Jupiter for, for protecting us from the bulk of all the crap that flies around the solar system. It, it is. Well, look, look I, I always like to quote, you know, uh, Shoemaker Levy 9. This was a, a comet that came in 1994, July 1994, and it crashed into Jupiter and it created a hole 12,000 kilometers wide on Jupiter. That's literally the size of the Earth. That's what <laughs> Jupiter does. Jupiter is this giant projector of the solar system, you know, and it's, it's funny because we always quote that Jupiter is this failed star, that it never became a, a star and it became a planet. So in its failure, it allowed us to survive. And for that, we thank it. And for that, we think that it's a failure. So if you ever get a bad grade or you fail a report or... Uh, you know, a grant or, you know, you get yelled at at work, someone else will survive because of it. <laughs> if Jupiter did. If Jupiter can do it, so can we. <laughs> and that is a perfect place to wrap up today's Talking Science. Brad, uh, thanks so much for uh, checking in. Thanks, Matt. Don't forget you can get early access to podcasts just like this one, as well as exclusive behind-the-scenes information by becoming a Trekzone member on Patreon. We're fast on our way to becoming a self-sustaining website, but we need your support. Become a member today and help Australia's unofficial home of Star Trek get even better. 100% of everything I raise on Patreon and through YouTube ads and the Super Chats on the live streams now as well goes into making Trekzone what it is and what it can be, something even bigger and better. But if membership isn't your thing, you can always keep up to date with Trekzone by following us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, as well as subscribing to the YouTube channel and podcast feeds. Leave comments, react to posts, react to the videos. Uh, it all makes us feel good on the inside and and uh, to me is just as important as uh, keeping the website self-sufficient. Brad's doing the social media thing as well. Find him on Facebook, Dr. Brad Tucker, and Twitter at btucker22. Or indeed, next week, right here on Australia's unofficial home of Star Trek, Trek Zone.